Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray for God's wisdom and understanding. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our unison reading this morning is not the one that's printed in the bulletin. It, <laughs> it is Psalm 17. It may be found in your pew Bible, the Old Testament portion, on page 496, Psalm 17. This psalm, like many other psalms, is a personal lament. The psalmist is in distress. He cries out for vindication. He prays for God to deliver him from his persecutors. Notice how the psalm ends on a note of confidence. When I awake, I shall be satisfied. He trusts that with God's help, he will come through his present distress. He is confident. He is hopeful. Please read together with me Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me, they close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They flush me out. Now they surround me. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground. They are like a lion eager to tear, like a young lion lurking in ambush. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. By your sword deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals. By your hand, O Lord, from mortals whose portion is life is in this world. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. It may be found in your pew Bible in the Old Testament on page 30. The story of Jacob's struggle with a man he could not overcome and who wounded Jacob echoes Jacob's inner spiritual struggle. In the end, Jacob realizes that his opponent is none other than God. Note also that part of his blessing comes because of his struggle and through his struggle. Please follow along while I read. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the, 
And the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place, the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose across him as he passed through Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you're a country music fan or a Garth Brooks fan, you may know that he describes the pivotal events in his life or controversies or crises or others as times that became blessings. And in holding out his hands, one palm up and one palm down, he'll rotate both saying what seemed to be a blessing was actually a curse. And what seemed to be a curse actually became a blessing. And he describes where fame and fortune were a blessing to him, but in his career took him away from his family and away from his daughters. It brought him to divorce with his wife, and fame and fortune became a curse. So he decided at the peak of his career to step away from his successful career and stay at home with his two daughters. And the curse became a blessing. He left the limelight for 14 years and has only in recent years come back into music again. But he said he doesn't regret a moment of it because his daughters have turned out so well and their family has amazing blessings in it. So with God's help, a, a job that was lost became a new opportunity. And, and parting ways with people he needed to part ways with led to some people who actually became better for his career. And criticism of his social justice song we Shall Be Free gave him courage of his convictions and actually led to other songs that endeared him to other people and wider acceptance. A curse became a blessing. And through the years, I've come to appreciate the story of Jacob wrestling the angel at the River Jabbok as just one of those type things. When I struggled with decisions or when I watched friends struggle with events in their lives and what to make of it and, and how to handle it and what to do, and, and when you have shared stories with me of why is this? Why has this come in my life? What do I do with this now? I found strength and courage in this story of Jacob's Riverside wrestling match with God. So let's wrestle with the story, and then I'll share a few positive, hopeful words. Do you remember the story, the background of Jacob? As a young uh, brother, he stole Esau, his brother's birthright. And the name Jacob is translated cheater, manipulator, usurper. When Jacob and Esau were born and they emerged from the mother's womb, Jacob was holding on to his brother's ankle. Later, Jacob grabbed Esau's birthright, stealing it away from him. And after doing that, he fled to Haran, where his uncle Laban tended him to hire his sheep and his cattle. that doesn't bother me, I'd rather have crying babies than no people in a quiet sanctuary. <laughs> God bless you. And we're glad to have you. Newly arrived. Congratulations to the Cherneskis. And the Wilsons are here with Eleanor for the first time back today. We're glad to have you with us as well. After deceiving his brother, then he flees to Haran. He is hired by his uncle to look after his shepherd, his sheep, his cattle, and others. And he tricks his uncle out of sheep and grows his own herds of cows. Laban has tricked Jacob. He wanted to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel, but he first tricked him into marrying Leah, his older sister, and then working several more years before he got to marry Rachel. And then they have their sons, and then they have this fortune, and things are going pretty well. And 20 years later, he decides he's going to get while the getting is good, and so he tricks Laban, and he flees during the night again with all of his people, with his caravan, with the sheep, everything. They flee. 
word gets to Laban, Jacob's left with everything. Laban and his family and the others pursue the caravan, overtake them, and now he is in this fight with his father-in-law Laban, who berates Jacob for leaving and for stealing his flocks and taking his household, even Laban's household gods he stole. Jacob doesn't know it, but Rachel, his wife, has stolen her father's household gods, the little idols, and when they search the tents to hide to find them, she sits on them and hides them. Jacob and Laban argue, but before finally they swear an oath not to harm one another or their descendants, and then Laban kisses his daughters goodbye and goes back home to Haran. Now comes this day of reckoning. Because life always catches up with us, doesn't it? When we must face ourselves and our unfinished business. So he has this wrestling match on the riverside. He's coming home and nearing home. He knows he's going to have to face his brother Esau on the far side and face his own guilt and what he had done. And when Jacob hears that Esau is coming with an army of 400 men, he divides his herds and his goats and his people and his possessions and sends them each in a separate direction, knowing that if one is overtaken, at least he'll have half of his family and half of his possessions. So Jacob sends messengers to Esau, each with a gift of livestock and, and, and goodies, hoping to appease Esau, buy off his revenge. And so with his families in hiding and knowing he's going to meet him the next day, Jacob is left alone for the night distressed over what's going to happen tomorrow when he meets his brother Esau. And then comes our text, this wrestling match. He says he was left alone, and he man wrestled with him till daybreak. Who's the man? Who's, who's he wrestling? Was it an angel? Some say he's wrestling his conscience. He's wrestling with his past deeds and what he's done with what he deserves? Is, is he wrestling with this decision to go back home? Should I do this? Should I go back? Wrestling his fears, maybe his, his plans, his, his own self? We don't know. But can't you identify with that story? I mean, who of us hasn't wrestled through the night with some decision or some situation? Tennessee Williams spoke of the wolf hours from two to four in the morning. When you wake up distressed and you can't get back to sleep and you, and you finally get up and you pace the room or walk around the house, troubled by the wolf prowling outside your door, whatever that wolf may be, your wolf can be a curse, but it may be a blessing. Your doubts, your questions, your struggles may push you toward maturity and faith and insight. Because we wrestle too. Who am I? What's, what's become of me? Why do I have to go through this? Am I lovable? Am, am I capable? Can others forgive me for what I've done? Can, can God forgive me? Shall I duck out and run again? Or, or shall I stay and face the consequences? Everything used to be so clear, so, so good, so right. What, what changed? What's happened? How did I get here? And the man Jacob wrestles can't get the best of Jacob. He can't defeat him. So he wounds him. He puts his hip out of socket. But still Jacob won't let go of the man. And as the sun is rising and the man pleads with Jacob to release him, Jacob refuses, I will not let you go until you bless me. I don't think he's pleading. I think he's demanding. I'm not going to waste this. What's your name? The stranger asked. You have to ask? Surely God knows Jacob's name. God knows everything. I think he's making Jacob acknowledge who he is. Jacob, thief, deceiver. He has to own up to his nature and force him to admit that I've stole my brother's blessings, I've stole from Isaac, I've stole from Esau, I've stole from Laban. I don't deserve this blessing that you're asking. And I think he's saying, you'll not steal another blessing. 
surprisingly, he does not shame him. He renames him. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, thief, but Israel, the one who wrestled God. You have wrestled with God, and you've wrestled with humans, and you've prevailed. So what are we to make of that? He didn't steal another blessing. God chose to give him a blessing. And changing his name reminds him that God chose to bless him and to give him something to talk about with others. Because after the blessing of the river Jabbok, the Jacob who limps home to his family is still not a very lovable character. Even after this God event, we don't have a Jacob we genuinely like. He's still a schemer. But what I appreciate is that when the chips were down, what did Jacob do? He still turned to God. He looked to God for help, and he's not going to waste this wrestling blessing. Despite all the sinister, sinister traits in Jacob's character, his mark of heroism is that he dared to turn to God to seek a blessing. He seized the moment and seized the blessing by holding on to the man as if to say, I'm not even going to let go of you as much as I'm in pain until you bless me out of this. The blessing he craved came not to a well-meaning, well-deserving man, but to a desperate man at the end of his rope. The glory still goes to God. The goodness is still from God. The blessing is God's choice, God's will, God's future for Jacob. He rewards his tenacity and blesses Jacob, just as he'll reward us too for our perseverance and our tenacity. If you turn to God, God will reward you and answer you. Maybe not in the ways you want or expect, but God always answers. And the stranger blesses Jacob and then just disappears from the story. And as for Jacob... He names the place where he camped Peniel, God's face. I saw God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. My life was spared. Much as the Psalm in 17, the psalmist says, I'll awake in the morning, and I, I will be blessed, and I will behold your face. Then Jacob limps home to face his family, and Esau, who's waiting, And Esau embraces him and welcomes him home. And Jacob is reconciled, but his limp is still going to humble him the rest of his life. It's a painful reminder what God brought him through, but also what God has delivered. So what are we to make of this story? What words of hope are there? If faith doesn't come easily to you, this this is your story. Because to wrestle, to struggle, is often at the core of what it means to be a Christian. And to wrestle with issues and wrestle with ourselves and wrestle with the Word that challenges us. And to trust God when we don't know what to do. The Hebrew verb to wrestle is used only one time in the Bible. Here. And it's a triple word play because we have three forms of the verb. The name, Yaakov, Jacob, the verb wrestled, Yaabek, and Jabbok, Yabak, all mean wrestling. Jabbok means wrestling river. And I think at times we too wrestle with God. We wrestle with our world. We wrestle with the issues. We wrestle with other people. We wrestle with ourselves, with our past, with our decisions that we must make and actions we must take and we're not sure what to do yet. We're wrestling with circumstances we don't understand. And sometimes those struggles are long and hard and draining, confusing. And struggles make us angry. Sometimes they make us despair and question. Question ourselves, question God, question why this? Is this fair? 
And we often feel alone in our struggles. And we think nobody struggles like I do. No one would understand my struggle. And so we choose to keep our wrestling to ourselves, quiet, in the darkness, in the lonely times. And sometimes our struggles leave us wounded, marked, limping. And we know we must not let go of it until some good kind of it, lest we miss the blessing that is to come. So we can't waste this time, this chance to change for the better. And so there is hope. Wrestling in the dark is not fun, but neither is it insurmountable. So this is what I've learned. God does not want to defeat us in our struggles. He wants to bless us. Sometimes God uh, delivers us from our struggles, sometimes through our struggles. And if you give up too soon, you miss the blessing that is awaiting at the end. So often the blessing comes as a result of the struggle. And sometimes the struggle is the blessing, and I'm better for it and better prepared for the other struggles that I know will come. If you remember Psalm 17, we read the psalmist, please, I shall call upon you for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words, show me your steadfast love, guard me from my adversaries, hide me in the shadow of your wings, deliver me. They, They surround me like a lion lurking in ambush, eager to tear. Deliver me, God, and I shall behold your face in righteousness. And when I awake, I shall be satisfied. Beholding your likeness. We all have tough times. We we all have those wolf hours of the night. But God is with you to deliver you. And God says over and over in the Old Testament and the New, fear not, I am with you to deliver you. And God may ask you, what is your name? Not because he doesn't know who you are, what you're facing, what's about to get the best of you, but sometimes to make you identify what is the real issue here. Make you name your need, your nemesis. Jacob left Jabbok the next morning with a new name, a new prospect, and in time his limp gave him something to talk about. It became his bumper sticker. Ask me about my limp, because it was an occasion to tell others who were wrestling with God what he had learned of wrestling with God and with himself and his circumstances, and know how his tenacity prevailed. And he would not be defeated now because he walked with God. You have a choice, too. You've been given a name. You you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't overlook the river, the water in the story of Jabbok too. And in that baptism, you were united forever with Christ. His nature comes to you. His strength comes to you. His power comes to you. His word comes to you. You share in his victory over sin and death and life everlasting and the victory in the life here and now. So you have a choice in your struggle to see your struggle as just another unwanted pain or a means to gain a blessing. You can choose up and let go or hang on and seek the blessing. Jacob was clever enough to demand a blessing in the middle of the fight and then hold on to receive it. And how else would we know this unless he told the story on himself when he saw his family and the villagers? Don't waste your struggle. Learn from it. Claim it and witness to others the blessings and the insights you have gained that God wrestles with us not to defeat us, but to bless us, to deliver us, to make us stronger, to make us wiser, to make us healthier, to make us more mature, to make us more compassionate toward others who are wrestling their demons, to make us capable of seeking and speaking the truth that will set other people free too. So pray and persist, and persevere, 
and trust God and don't give up. Hang on until the dawn and turn the curse into a blessing and go into the new day with a blessing for those awaiting you. The good news in Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. God, it's all that easy, isn't it? But it's all that hard. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. Give us courage. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen.